The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. Welcome from the General Assembly and the City of Richmond. I'm Woody, A Woody Evans for Cable Reports and Cox Communications. And welcome to our very special guest today, Senator Tommy Norman, representing the 3rd District. He's also the Senate Majority Leader. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Woody. It's nice to be with you, even if you're tripping over your own I know. A that's bit. amazing. It's a little early this morning, but I know it's not early for you because you start really early here in Richmond. Well, I have to. You know, when you're as slow as I am, you need to stretch the day out as long as you can. And uh, I've made a lot of people tongue-tied over the years, so I apologize for doing it to you so early in the morning. Well, two th 2013, and we have another short session, 46 days, and we're almost at the uh, halfway point uh, Give us the lay of the land, generally speaking, about uh, how things are proceeding in the Senate. Well, I think looking at it from maybe 30,000 feet, as you and I were talking a little earlier, that the, the intensity and the velocity that legislation is moving during these 45 days is almost reaching the point of being ridiculous. You and I were chatting, and I believe back in the 70s, was the first time that they started holding a legislative session during the odd years. And the whole scheme was just to amend uh, the state budget. In Virginia, we adopt a two-year budget in the even years. So some brilliant individual came up with the idea that, w that we needed a session during the odd years just to amend the budget. Well, that's grown into a full-blown session now. In addition to amending the budget, there's anywhere from two to 2,000 to 3,000 pieces of legislation mm -hmm. that are introduced. And the importance of that is it just breeds chaos, uh, the intensity with which we're trying to move legislation uh, just compresses uh, what we're trying to do. It creates tensions. Uh, it's hardly time to even reflect on, on expectations. So you've got that natural overlay uh, in addition to some very contentious subjects this year in the area of transportation. Uh, redistricting has certainly attracted a lot of attention. Uh, there's some lingering social issues. So it uh, ha has been quite a challenge. Uh, I haven't been tongue-tied. I've just been mentally tied. <laughs> Well, tell us a little bit more about your responsibilities as the Senate Majority Leader, as well as your chairmanship of Courts of Justice and membership on the Senate Finance Committee, which is a very influential body. Well, sometimes I, I wake up at 3.30 in the morning and I try to figure out how I'm going to balance all of these uh, responsibilities uh, that I've been very privileged to, to take on. Uh, if, from being the majority leader of the Senate, uh, basically what I do is oversee the flow of legislation and the activities that take place on the on the floor of the Senate. Uh, I try to do that very ecumenically and and fair, uh, without regard to, to partisanship. Um, obviously, I do lead the Republicans. Um, I have uh, a lot of responsibilities there. Uh, in the Senate Republican Caucus, we have to operate by consensus. Uh, there really is no stick and no carrot, uh, a little bit different than the structure of the House of Delegates, where the Speaker has much bro broader discretion and authority than I do. Um, so it takes a lot of time to try to give everyone an opportunity to be heard and see if you can get 20 individuals to develop a consensus mm -hmm. and move in a common direction. Uh, every member of the General Assembly, all 140 of us are prima donnas and have brilliant ideas, consequently trying to get 20 individuals to congeal on a common idea and move in, a, in, a, in the same direction at the same time is uh, always an interesting experience. Uh, on the Courts Committee, I, I do chair that. Uh, we've had some extraordinary chairmen of the Courts Committee uh, in the past. Uh, going back into the early 90s uh, when uh, Senator Ed Holland did an extraordinary gentleman. Uh, then that was followed uh, by uh, Senator uh, uh, 
getting tongue tied with my good <laughs> friends. It's contagious this morning. Uh, Ken Stolle, I okay. uh, did it for a number of years, who's now the sheriff of Virginia Beach. Uh, and uh, I've been doing it for the last two years. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with that committee is not just the legislation that is introduced ranging from everything from civil issues to capital murder mm -hmm. issues, but just the sheer volume. I think we're just about a week away from crossover and we still have about 65 bills that we have to take up. The workload is exceptional. Fortunately, I'm blessed uh, and the committee's blessed with a very good staff. We have a lot of volunteers from the Crime Commission, the Commonwealth Attorneys Association. Um, so that helps distribute the workload, but that's very challenging. And then finance. What a yes. load. What an absolute load. Uh, the governor has introduced a, a, a whole lot of amendments to the budget. We've got very little unanticipated revenues that some euphemistically refer to as a surplus. Mm -hmm. I refer to it as unanticipated revenues um, and uh, trying to determine how to allocate uh, those unanticipated revenues. Uh, I think every member of the Senate has budget amendments in that wants to try to reappropriate monies. Many of those budget amendments are, are very well founded. Some others are sort of altruistic uh, and uh, put in for a variety of reasons. But we have to report the budget out on Sunday, this c coming Sunday this, night. This coming Sunday. Uh, and we're taping this on a Wednesday, so that gives you some idea of the time frame that we have. Uh, and there's some huge issues in there, not the least of which is, is transportation. Uh, the governor's proposed a very ambitious transportation a plan that requires proceeds. So, and so, this is one issue that the lieutenant governor cannot break a tie on, the budget? Well, th that's true, sir. Uh, uh, there are certain uh, tie-breaking votes that the lieutenant governor may cast, but there are certain uh, very explicit prohibitions where the lieutenant governor cannot cast a tie-breaking vote. The budget is one of the most significant right. ones that he cannot break. Uh, you may recall that uh, we went into overtime a little bit last year yes. as we had a, a, a partisan breakdown in the Senate and for many, many days we could not pass a budget because 20 Republicans voted in favor of a budget and 20 Democrats basically decided to hold it hostage to try to make a point. Is that likely to happen again? I don't think so. There, there certainly are some underlying political and partisan tensions. Uh, I think that both the Republicans and the Democrats on reflection of 2012 realized that that was not a good strategy, mm -hmm. that it was not a good approach for Virginians. And frankly, the average citizen really doesn't care that much about the inside baseball and the partisan politics that takes place in the General Assembly building. They just want us to do our work. Uh, and the average citizen just is not interested in this this party bickering. So no, I don't expect it to happen. And of course, year. they don't want uh, the General Assembly to become like what's going on in Washington, D.C. Gosh, I, I certainly hope not. Every time I hear that c comparison between the Virginia General Assembly and what's going on in Washington, D.C., it, it just nauseates me. I, I assume you're still hearing about uh, the critical issues of jobs and the economy from your constituents in uh, New Kent, King, and Queen counties. Well, New Kent and King and Queen are, are more rural, rural communities. Uh, New Kent is, is uh, getting urbanized a little bit as they're getting some pressures coming out of Richmond. Uh, and so they have some communities are, that are developing. Uh, King William uh, and even down in King and Queen uh, are more rural, they have a more static population. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I am hearing a, a lot. Uh, I mean, we're coming out of this recessionary trough, which Virginia has not been immune from, but there's still a lot of anxiety, uh, I think, just widespread about how the economy is doing, what are the job opportunities, what kind of economic development opportunities are in there. And when you're a smaller community like King William or King and Queen uh, or New Kent, uh, a very small hiccup in the economy can disrupt your, your, the local uh, economy and, and, and local budgets. 
so I am hearing quite a bit from uh, my constituents uh, in those areas, and they are all interested in any economic development opportunity that would enhance their tax base, take some pressure off the residential real estate tax, and afford job opportunities. Now, your, uh, your membership on the Senate Finance Committee includes chairing the Education Subcommittee, I believe. Yes, sir, it does. And, of course, the governor has a uh, initiative. Uh, he's had a lot of proposals over the past few years, but he has some more specific proposals this year, including a pay raise to teachers and uh, 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 an attempt to uh, uh, reform the contracts that teachers work under at, at the local level. Talk to us about those issues. The governor under, undertook uh, some reformation or reforms uh, in public education as well as higher education. Been a lot of focus on public education. For the last couple of years, I've chaired the Senate Finance Subcommittee that deals with K-12 through public education, also higher education. Uh, last year, the governor undertook an, an initiative to reform the contract relationship between local school boards and teachers. It was not successful. Uh, this year, the governor asked me to, and the Senate, to actually care, carry his ed education reform. Uh, it was a Teacher Fairness Act. I am very pleased to say that it was reported out of the Senate Education and Health Committee unanimously. unanimously. There was not a single dissenting vote, and that was not a credit to me. That is a credit to the, to the stakeholders. Uh, that the governor's uh, administrative team uh, engaged in some very meaningful discussions uh, with the Virginia Education Association, mm -hmm. with the Virginia Association of School Boards, and all of these groups came together and there was a very earnest give and take and negotiation on some of the specific terms of that bill that resulted in everyone standing up and saying, we support the bill. So there are some changes, and when I presented it to the bill to the Education and Health Committee, I said this is just not a Fairness on Teachers Act. It is a Fairness on Teachers and Administrators. Mm -hmm. And what the bill does is it deals with certain uh, benchmark performance uh, areas of excellence for teachers and administrators. It provides for a probationary period, depending upon the local school board, from three to five years. It mandates that uh, the teachers will have evaluations, shockingly enough, even though there's been an expectation for classroom observation and evaluations that they don't take place. And in the absence of really having those benchmarks and evaluations, it makes it pretty challenging to evaluate the overall performance of a teacher, particularly if there is some consideration uh, either for remedial action with that teacher or for not renewing the contract. Mm -hmm. And the same thing uh, with, with principals, administrators. Uh, so there are some fairly significant reforms in there, but I was very pleased that while last year the VEA strenuously opposed the bill, that they were comfortable in working it out this year. We created a, a new grievance process, uh, if you will, with a hearing officer. Mm -hmm. And one of the points of contention was originally as the bill was drafted, it provided that a hearing officer uh, could and would be a member of the school administration. I see. The teachers didn't think that was particularly objective. And to everyone's credit, we now have uh, an independent third-party hearing officer who will make recommendations to the school board. And that hearing officer must have qualifications and experience in education and education law. And while the hearing officer conducts the hearing and takes evidence, he or she makes only a recommendation to the school board. So there has not been any subterfuge or weakening of our system in Virginia that the school boards ultimately retain the authority. So that's really been a very satisfying piece of legislation for, for me to work on, and particularly when my oldest daughter is a teacher. Oh, that's great. That is just great. Now, uh, School districts have, from time to time, and year after year, there's been an effort to uh, allow school districts to control their calendar. Because right now, even though there are a lot of waivers granted, uh, you can't begin school until after Labor Day. And I know there's a bill dealing with that uh, on the agenda again. 
Well, yeah, I think there are about 13 bills. 13. That, um, more than I have fingers, I know that. Uh, uh, this Labor Day uh, legislation has uh, been revisited by the General Assembly every year, and unfortunately uh, it's become rather contentious. Uh, because th those areas of Virginia that are highly dependent on tourism and visitor attendance, uh, it, it has a significant impact. Mm -hmm. A lot of Virginians do not realize the significance of tourism as an economic engine. It generates anywhere from 17 to 19 billion dollars a year. That in, much? In wow. 17 to 19 billion dollars in revenue to Virginia. Um, and I, of course, represent the historic triangle mm -hmm. and have been have for many years. I've been very involved with the Jamestown, Yorktown Foundation. I sit on the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation mm -hmm. Board of Trustees. And that's just one area of Virginia where there are tourism venues all across Virginia. Well, one of the uh, things that happens in these uh, tourism-based communities is that during the summer months that they, they hire a lot of young people. And I remember a couple of years ago, if I walked through Bush Gardens, uh, there would be a lot of J-1 students, or, or what we referred to as foreign students who I got see. a temporary work <clears throat> permit. You walk through Bush Gardens or Water Country, USA, or Colonial Williamsburg, or Jamestown, Yorktown, now all you see are young people from the community or within driving distance mm -hmm. and retirees who are looking to supplement their income. The concern is if, if in fact the Labor Day uh, bills were to pass and allow school systems to open up in advance of, of Labor Day, uh, I've been told like in Bush Gardens, they would lose a thousand workers. A thousand. A thousand wow. workers. Uh, Virginia Beach, a huge tourism destination, and there's some synergy between Virginia Beach and the historic triangle as people come for visits. Uh, so it, it is a very, very significant issue. Um, and because of the economy, uh, more and more young people have gotten into to the workforce. Uh, fewer foreign students are, are coming in, and there is a dependency, whether it is ranging from being a park ride attendant to an admissions person to working to supplement the administrative staff during mm -hmm. that, that critical period of time where the tourism is coming in. Uh, but there are other communities where tourism is not a vital right. industry, and there are certain weather considerations that come in. Uh, I just continue to resist a wholesale repeal uh, of the of the Labor Day bill uh, because it is going to have a significant adverse financial impact uh, on Virginia. And the interesting thing is, by law, the students have to go 180 days. So it's a question of of when they start. Does does moving it back a week affect right. the educational right. experience? Absolutely not. And so the waiver process takes care of those who have sure. these in terms of weather and, and other related uh, matters. Uh, the other bill that uh, uh, was initiated uh, last year as a result of uh, uh, Tim Tebow's NFL fame and the fact that he had been homeschooled deals with the authority of uh, local schools to allow those homeschooled uh, children to participate in athletics. It's back before us again. It appears to be gathering a little bit more traction. Uh, how do you see that working out? Well, the, the, the Tebow bill uh, is interesting. As you and I were talking before we went on the air, uh, both of us have enormous respect for Tim Tebow as, as an individual. Uh, I think he is uh, one of the most positive images in professional sports. Um, he doesn't suffer from being an egomaniac. Uh, he is faith-based, he is team-oriented, and is not self-grandizing himself. Um, now, of course, he's got some issues on maintaining <laughs> his job in the NFL, which is neither here nor there. Uh, but he really has drawn attention across the country as to whether or not homeschoolers or those who are not uh, voluntarily attending public schools should have the opportunity to participate in, in public school sports. Uh, it is, I think the legislation is gaining a little more traction. 
I believe in the Senate that uh, Tom Garrett out of Louisa mm -hmm. has has the bill. Uh, I'm not very good at forecasting the weather even when the day is over, much less uh, forecasting the fate of legislation. Uh, I think you're going to continue to see some resistance to that legislation. Uh, I know it was heard in the House uh, earlier in the week, and uh, I think the Virginia Education Association and the school board associations came out uh, against that. And what really was interesting to me is that I think some of the students got thrown into the breach on this, that mm -hmm. uh, a home school uh, student was saying, hey, you know, I want the opportunity to participate in sports, that I right. play sports in the community, but I miss the experience of being able to do it through elementary and middle and high school, and therefore there's a disassociation with my friends. And then here came the other side of it with another young person put in the breach of this legislative debate, and that young lady was saying, you know, if they're not coming to public schools, then they're not integrated in the whole process and a homeschooler does not have to meet some of these benchmark mm -hmm. prerequisites that those of us in public school do. And many school districts are talking about increasing their GPA in order for you to participate in, in public school sports, mm -hmm. which they ought to be. They ought to be. I think you know some of these young athletes ought to have the inducement to keep their academics up rather than thinking they're just there to, to play a sport. Um, but that young lady was saying, you know, they don't have to meet the same benchmarks that I do, right. and I might get displaced on a position on a, on a team sport by someone who doesn't go to school there, doesn't interact with the, the rest of us, and doesn't even have to meet the same criteria that I do. Uh, it's going to remain a contentious issue, and uh, while Tim Tebow has his name associated with it, I'm not sure that he would embrace the controversy that's surrounding it. Probably not. Now, someone tells me that transportation is uh, is a big issue. Uh, we're fast approaching Groundhog Day, which I believe is Saturday, <laughs> and it seems like uh, it's Groundhog Day again around here. Um, I know that there are a number of bills. Um, which You've been talking to Bill Murray or somebody, haven't you? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> number of bills uh, with different approaches to solving a critical problem that has existed as long as you've been here at least I'm sure uh, but talk to us a little bit about the governor's initiative and uh, where you think things may wind up uh, this session in terms of transportation funding transportation has been the most frustrating and disappointing uh, area of state government that I have dealt with in the 22 years that I've been here Interestingly enough, the last meaningful initiative on transportation was in 1986 under then-Governor Gerald Belisles, who probably 80% of the members of the General Assembly only know from history books because it's been that much, sure. that much turnover. Um, and it's been a contentious issue. Um, I told someone not long ago that individually I have left more legislative blood on the floor of the Senate over mm -hmm. transportation than any other issue. And I, that includes social issues, budgetary mm -hmm. issues. Um, and the really frustrating thing is that while we talk about core responsibilities of government, transportation has kind of moved off to the side. And anyone who drives uh, on the interstates in Virginia knows that our transportation infrastructure is deteriorating, not just in the quality of the roads with the number of potholes and things, but also the congestion. Uh, and it, it's going to affect our economy. We were talking a few minutes ago about the Labor Day bill. Uh, the historic triangle is a drive-based destination. Mm -hmm. Virginia Beach is a drive-based destination. People don't fly into Williamsburg, Jamestown, right. Yorktown. They don't fly into Virginia Beach. They drive. And if you're planning a family vacation where time is so critical in this day and age, do you want to get stuck in the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel for two and a half hours? Especially if it's raining hard. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> uh, so the governor has taken the initiative, once again, to try to get a transportation plan through. He's proposed a very elaborate transportation 
plan that includes trying to generate some new funding. There's what they call the, the Fair Tax Act, which is basically uh, the state trying to recover stale sales tax on internet internet uh, purchases. Right. Uh, Something we're supposed to be declaring and paying. As I understand. Well, you and I both do it, but there's <laughs> probably course. one or two other people out there. I mean, maybe the cameramen don't, re re you know, report it. But right. You and I report it all. Of course. Um, on it. Um, and that's part of it. He's also proposed uh, increasing uh, the registration fee for your vehicles by $15. We're one of the lowest in the country. Uh, he's further pr uh, proposed uh, uh, a hybrid registration right. fee of $100 because the hybrid cars are, are not using gas much gasoline and therefore they're not contributing to the cost of the roads. Uh, he has a, a number of other uh, initiatives that are in there, uh, but there's a lot of discussion about it, a lot of discussion. Uh, the House delegates is working on an approach which I think will pretty much replicate what the, the governor has asked for. Uh, the Senate has not congealed on a transportation plan. Uh, the Finance Committee and some of the other individuals who are really interested in transportation have been working very, very hard to try to get the ingredients to put together a recipe that would be acceptable mm -hmm. both to Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and there's a pretty significant chasm there ideologically on how to pay for transportation in the Senate. Uh, the Democrats do not want any general funds or money out of our right. general operating account to go towards transportation because they make the argument that that potentially will be diverting funds from education, health, and human resources. Even though we already divert some right. funds, it's a little bit of a shell game. But they honestly adopt that position, and I'm not critical of it. And then you've got the, some of the more conservative re Republicans who are resistant to uh, the raising taxes. And, of course, one of the things, you know, that the governor has, has talked about is, is tinkering with, with, the, with the gas tax and their discussions in the Senate with everything from increasing the gas tax to eliminating the gas tax and imposing the equivalent of a sales tax at the wholesale level. So there are a lot of variables out there. I just would say to you, Woody, I would be incredibly disappointed if at the end of the day, around February the 23rd, that we come out of this 2013 session with no transportation plan, it would be an egregious disservice to the citizens of Virginia. But it could happen because of a political lockup. Well, as they say, when you're having fun, time flies, and we're just about out of time. But I want to thank you for being here, Senator Tommy Norman, Senate Majority Leader. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. I've had a lot of fun. Good. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Cox Communications. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans.